Hello and welcome along to the Prevention is the New Cure podcast. This is episode 14 of our little pod. I'm Steve Bryan. I'm the MP for Winchester in Hampshire and the chair of the Health and Social Care Select Committee in the House of Commons. And I'm Helen Stokes Lampard. I'm a frontline GP in the Midlands. And until recently, I was chair of the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges. And nowadays, I'm a professor at the University of Birmingham. Hello, Helen. Hi, Steve. How are you doing? Keeping cool. Oh, well, we'll come on to heat later, I'm sure. It's a sticky old day, isn't it? It's a sticky day in Westminster, certainly, on so many different levels. We're currently (laughs) debating school buildings. Yeah. But this pod is about many things. It's not about that. (laughs) Um, So last time on the pod, episode 13, we had my good friend Emma on and her father, Paul, uh, who lost her brother, his son, Owen, to anaphylactic reaction to eating a burger at Byron Burger and they've mm. since launched this amazing Owens Law campaign mm-hmm. I've seen that they, they've obviously posted the link to our podcast episode with them on their social media channels and I've seen a pretty huge reaction to it and uh, that campaign's going places I think it really is you know several people have picked up with me about the conversation about anaphylaxis they hadn't realized just how serious it is and that it really can be fatal I think there's been a little bit of complacency amongst people that you know a lot of people grow out of allergies we've got EpiPens and great treatments available but when those things fail us um actually we've all got a responsibility to act so yeah good reaction good reaction yeah uh, on a very serious topic yeah um, we also last time we also covered the horrific uh, Lucy Letby murder a trial um, and some of the implications for the NHS and wider society. Now, things have moved on a bit since then. And you waxed lyrical last time, as I recall, that you felt very strongly that the um, inquiry that had been proposed wasn't going far enough. That's changed since, hasn't it? Yeah, I said that it needs to be a statutory judge-led inquiry that has the statutory powers to compel witnesses to come to it. And um I just couldn't see, I I think I said that it it was inevitable that that's where it would end up. And sure enough, that is where it has ended up. And Secretary of State gave a statement to the Commons on Monday when he announced that. And he announced um, Lady Justice Thurwell, uh, Kate Thurwell, Mm -hmm. who is going to chair the inquiry and it will be statutory. And I was thinking, you know, if I was the health minister and I was sent out on the airwaves to explain why it's not a statutory inquiry, uh, I couldn't think of a good reason why. I, I thought it was in ministers' interests for it to be as strong as possible. Yeah. And, you know, I think they've come to the conclusion, having talked to the families who wanted it to be that and to have as strong a power as it possibly could. And it may take a bit longer as a result of that. But mm. I think the, the, but the important thing is that it's going to be done in phases and it's going to report in phases. Good. So you're not going to have to wait years for for outcomes. And hopefully it will also, and we're going to help with that on the select committee, do a little bit of looking at what previous health public inquiries have recommended to see where government system dragging its feet on implementing some of those recommendations. So I think, you know, we're in as good a place as we possibly can be after the horror of what Lucy Letby's done. And she's now what, a couple of weeks into 14 life sentences. Yeah, and I'm I'm absolutely right that she is too. Um, From my point of view, I think the implications for NHS leadership and management are quite significant. And I think, you know, some serious and deep reflections already going on. Um, So I suspect in advance of whatever the review comes up with and the inquiry comes up with that we will see some changes. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of ripples that are still going on throughout the healthcare system. You know, the, the, the newspapers might have moved on, but I think the NHS is going to be scarred by this one for a long time to come. Anyway. Yeah, I, I said in the House on Monday that as we go forward with this, what we cannot do and we need to be on our guard against is this us versus them mentality in hospital trusts. Yeah. Us being managers and them being clinicians, because surely any successful trust is one team. Yes. You know, is where that, that is flattened. And if you, I was talking to Amanda Pritchard this week, the chief executive of the NHS, she was reminding me that half of the chief executives in London are actually clinicians. Yeah. 
So, you know, having clinicians running health trusts is a good thing. Sometimes yeah. having managers to give a different perspective is a good thing. That yeah. does not mean, that does not mean that there doesn't need to be good regulation of doctors, which there is for the GMC. It doesn't mean that there doesn't need to be a, re a, a change regime around management so that they're better supported. But also when they do depart jobs, and sometimes they're forced out of jobs, they don't just pop up somewhere else the next month and it's that kind of it's that change that i think needs to come and i think it will come um and it will come out in the inquiry and i'm sure that's a good thing and i suspect this will be something we'll come back to at a later stage although it's not directly about prevention but you know it, it could certainly be argued that good leadership and management prevents a whole heap of problems further down the line so i, I think we can justify keeping it as a topic on the pod in future yeah, I mean, look, good good leadership in in a trust that clearly broke down in yep. Countess of Chester, and you know, good leadership is important in any organisation. It's important in a GP practice. It's important in a hospital trust. It's important in government, yeah. and uh, that's what we're going to have to be looking at. And we, as select committee, are going to be doing some work around whistleblowing and connected to leadership. Excellent, Steve. It's the first podcast after. Uh, recess is over everyone's back at work back at school uh how is it feeling out there right now um well the first day back was monday we had very late votes on monday i was in downing street at seven o'clock the next morning talking to the prime minister about net zero so i was tired by Whoa. monday breakfast um i think people are they're just a little weary of the battle to come and there are many battles to come of course we've been thrust straight back into the, the rack school buildings oh. issue uh this week the public accounts committee which i'm doing a guest spot on is talking about rack in hospitals which is a massive issue that is a concern and I what think about yeah what about people are just GP a little surgeries? bit people are a bit weary about the the election year to come i think yeah i was gonna say rack in gp surgeries is that a thing well it could be i mean we haven't heard We've heard about court buildings. We've heard about prisons. We've heard about schools and hospitals. We haven't heard anything else in the public realm. But what I do know, being a former journalist, is that this is a story that keeps on giving. Yeah. And I think they're going to ensure that it does. Yeah. So you've been on holiday since we last met. Yeah, I have. Um, it wasn't a conventional holiday. You know, I do like my hot, hot breaks on the beach. But this was a bit of a staycation, a bit of a DIY marathon and a bit of seeing family down in Wales. Um, some things were wonderful. Something didn't quite go to plan. Um, a large screw in our tyre when we were on our tour around in Wales put, curtailed some of our activities. And I'm really nice. sorry to the family members we didn't get to see. But so grateful to the wonderful guy in the garage who... Uh, dropped what he was doing and fixed our tyre for us, allowing us to get home safely. So, uh, yeah, a big pl <laughs> plug, sorry, no pun intended, uh, to Gorse Garages for a stepping up to the mark of a damsel in distress and her engineer husband who were very crestfallen on Monday morning. Yeah. Anyway. So, look, there's loads of things we want to talk about. No guests this week, so plenty of us. Um, sorry for <laughs> listeners. Uh, the, the, the story that sort of dominated health, this week since we've returned back and it's sort of linked in a way to a lot of post letby stuff and patient power patients being at the center of their care is this issue of martha's rule have you followed this yeah i've seen a bit about it but tell me more because i know this is something you've been heavily involved in i mean i can think talk about it from the healthcare side but tell me from the the big so so a young lady called martha mills died um before her, you know, she was a young teenager. She died died um, on holiday in, in Wales. She had a cycling accident. And her mum, Merop, has been speaking to the BBC about um, what she's campaigning for, which is called Martha's Rule, which the government has said that it's going to explore. And and in a, in a nutshell, what it is, is about giving families, patients, the ability to to demand a second opinion. Um, long story short, what, what happened in, in poor Martha's case is that she actually died of, of sepsis and the wow. parents had said, the mother had said, you know, that we, we suspect this. And long story short, that wasn't what was investigated. And, uh, and so she is pushing for this Martha's rule around a second opinion yeah. in often in, in emergency settings in trusts. So it's 
I mean, I can imagine that some NHS organisations are groaning at the prospect of requests for more opinions, creating even more demand in a system that's already stretched under pressure. But, you know, I agree. Getting this right is so important, Steve. Time and time again, as a frontline clinician, I have seen situations where it's the relatives and the loved ones of the patient that provides the big clue that something is going wrong, that whatever the monitors or the blood tests are saying, something is actually going wrong. And that's the early warning signal. And um, there's a concept we talk about in medicine about the uh, the expert patient. You know, the person who knows most about the individual is the patient themselves. But when they're not able to provide that insight, it can often be their loved ones that can provide it. And clearly, if people are in a lot of pain or sedated or whatever they're not able to be as articulate and the number of times I've seen that that happen where it has speeded up a diagnosis it has alerted us to the fact that we should act a bit more swiftly or investigate a bit further so I think this is really important I would what I would urge is is a very careful consultation in what right looks like just a simplistic everyone has the right to a second opinion is probably too simple it probably needs to be a bit more complicated than that but i think this is such a, a powerful argument for doing something good so what's going to be happening next hmm, well the government of basic as speaking the secretary of state about this the other night the government have asked nhs england to go away and do a piece of work on this i mean this is it's not to say that i think the first thing to say is that the, the right to a second opinion has long existed um you know you are you are entitled to to ask for such i think yeah. what this is about is about maybe formalizing that as a patient right. I don't know whether that's through the patient's charter, through the NHS constitution or, or how you do that. But there are also trusts that operate this already very well. So the Royal Berkshire would be a good example of that. You know, they have a special um, patient safety team. Mm -hmm. They call it call for concern, where that that process is therefore already in place to do it. And the reason why this is connected to Letby, I think, is because it is about patient safety. It is about patient involvement in their care and the way i sort of see patient safety is i think there's sort of three sides to to this triangle there's the the view of the clinical staff you know, their yeah. professional opinion there's the what the numbers are saying what what the technology is telling you the blood tests the diagnostics and then there's patients and families and when those three work together i think you're in a good place so the principle of Martha's rule, which is already exists in Queensland, uh, down under, for instance, is perfectly logical. Who who could dis disagree? And it's a what what a way for a, a mother to honor what honor her daughter. The practicalities mm. of this, the sort of freedom to speak up, and and how you mandate it, if you like, across the NHS, is what concerns me. Because okay, on a regular Wednesday afternoon, it's one thing. What about a bank holiday Monday morning? Yeah. What about a Saturday night? Absolutely. What about the team that have made the original decision, of course, have then got to be able to brief the incoming second team as to why they made that first decision? Does a second opinion become a third if you don't get the answer that you are looking for the second time? Yeah. And, you know, that's not to be insensitive about this. It's just to look as we must as policymakers about practicalities of this kind of change. Does that make sense to a clinician? Totally makes sense. And I've seen many times where people go doctor shopping. They don't like what one doctor tells them. So they go to another doctor or another healthcare professional, whether it are a counselor or a psychiatrist or whatever. So yeah, it, it, it is a real thing, which is why I guess I was saying at the start, this needs to be thought through very carefully and just a simple blanket rule isn't the way to go. Um, but unpicking it, working out what good really would look like um, and coming to some sort of sensible consensus. But I do have to say that Martha's mum seems to be speaking and arguing in a very cogent, uh, intelligent way about this and what she wants is something very logical which would improve patient safety in the long run you know she really has spoke really beautifully and with great grace this week and yeah talking to the secretary of state i mean he has been been doing some work on this i think for some time and this mm. has really given it some rocket boosters the, the the other challenge just finally i think would be about access and equality uh, the yeah. equity of this because 
this this can't just be available to those the sharp elbows in the middle classes who, mm-hmm. who know where to go and yeah. know which phone number to use you know this has to be available across the system and that's the challenge as ever in a national i use the word advisory a national health service which is actually not of course it's a series of trusts and i suppose in general practice which obviously is your your specialism the right to a second opinion i suppose there's more time in general practice in primary care to go and seek a second opinion but of course it exists because you don't have to stay with your gp you can you can go to another gp at any time you like you can, and perhaps it's a little known thing that, that that actually if a patient wants to change a GP, it's a relatively straightforward process. You go to another surgery, say, hi, will you take me on? They say yes or no. And it's only a small number of circumstances in which they can say no, as long as you live within the geographical patch. Um, and then all the rest happens automatically. You don't have to explain or anything. Um, to be honest with you, when people go into doctor shopping and moving around, it doesn't always give them the answers that they want. Uh, but that's a whole different conversation for another time, Steve. Do you think we should take a break? Let's take a break. Welcome back. Steve, I don't think it's going to have escaped anyone's notice that we have had some pretty hot weather the last few days and it's going to continue into the weekend. And just in case anyone's listening to this in the dim distant future, we're recording this on Wednesday the 6th of September and it's going to go out on the morning of the 7th of September which follows a pretty rubbish August where we've had two named storms and the sixth wettest July on record. How do you cope with the weather, Steve? Uh, Not well. Better than my teenage daughter who goes back to school today and is extremely annoyed, quotes, it's not fair, that the weather has been rubbish during her summer holiday and is now really hot that she's got to go back to school. As she, she, She said, it's just going to make me dizzy. Yeah, it is, it is pretty um, harsh on kids who've just had six weeks of school holiday. I definitely concede that. Now, in general, I like hot weather. I'm a warm weather person. I'm a summer person. Um, I know you are much more of a winter person, right? Yeah, well, autumn, yes. Autumn. I, I I love autumn. Okay, and I'm probably spring is probably my favourite season. So, yeah, okay. See, this is why we work. We're a balance. Exactly. Um, but look, I picked up on a story this week. Uh, obviously, you know, we get the hot weather. There's always the conversation about how to stay safe in hot weather. Um, uh, but there's a story I want to pick up on um, about myths around sun cream. People with darker skin, I've often heard people with darker skin sort of be fairly flippant when it comes to using sun protection. But I haven't taken it too seriously because everyone gets the same advice from the NHS about protect themselves against the sun. But it turns out a lot of people with um darker skin of all sorts of hues seem to believe that they're pretty immune to skin cancers and the sunburn which is patently not true have you come across this this is the story that you that you spotted um which said exactly that past studies have found that people are less likely to but that myth has been busted Busted well and truly. Um, really interesting comments from some dermatologists that having a darker skin, which means you've got more uh, melatonin in your skin to give it the darker pigment, um, does have a slightly protective effect, but only the equivalent of sun cream of about sun protection factor seven. Now, SPF seven is so weak, we never bother and we couldn't possibly sell it because it's too mild a benefit. You know, we talk about an absolute minimum of factor 20 nowadays as being helpful for protection and ideally factor 30 and for full sunblock factor 50. So there's a just a really good prevention message here that just because you haven't got pale Caucasian skin, it doesn't mean you're immune to the effects of sunburn. It This matters to you too. Risks of skin, skin cancers, risks of burning and ageing. I mean, simple effect, the sun ages us uh, once we get any burn. Anyway, that was just a quick one from me, perhaps a public information broadcast. Do you see a lot of skin cancers and skin lesions in your work? Oh, huge amount, huge amount. Do I mean, you? oh, loads. I mean, a, a lot of things happen because certain skin types get a lot of sort of age related changes so you know more freckling of the skin uh you've you will have seen the sort of slightly lumpier warty looking growth on people as in the skin ages seborrheic seb- keratoses uh, and those are not sinister; so they're sun damage but they're not cancerous but of course for the public you know they don't know the difference between them and quite rightly they seek the quite appropriately seek advice from a healthcare professional as you definitely should if you've got new uh, strange skin lesions um 
And then a tiny proportion of what we see in general practice, we refer on to dermatologists and in turn, a small proportion of those turn out to be cancers. But, you know, I've been wrong footed a couple of times. I've referred things not really thinking they were sinister. They've turned out to be. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's um, skin cancer can definitely catch you out. There are three main types of skin cancer. The most aggressive type melanoma tends to present with very dark, nasty, fast growing lesions. But the most benign type, the sort of basal cell carcinomas, um, which grow in one place, they never spread, they don't kill people, but they can cause local destruction, um, can be very insidious. So uh, yeah, quite a range. I suppose in, in a way, it's, uh, there's another story I spotted, which is that, you know, our friends at the BMJ Oncology. Mm. Um, so this is a story that's been doing the rounds th today. The number of cancer cases among the under 50s, which is why it caught my eye in relation to, to the sun, sun issue. Mm around the world appears to have risen sharply in the past 30 years. Research published in the BMJ Oncology found there have been 3.26 million cases in 2019, 79% more than in 1990. Now, that, as ever with a story, you can read whatever you want into it and certain levels of panic, but experts mm. cautioned against reading too much into the findings because it didn't take account of a 40% rise in total population, mm. while Possibly, you know, factors such as better reporting may have also played a role. What do you reckon? I think it's really interesting. Certainly, I always start with a caveat about what's the baseline population. You know, are we recording better? And certainly whilst the UK has been very good at recording stuff for the last 30 years, years or so, that's definitely not the case globally. So, yes, very big pinch of salt in that sense. But there are interesting questions here, particularly that it's risen, the cancers have risen in a couple of specific areas. There is probably something in that. Is this lifestyle related things? I mean, it was, so it was the digestive system. That's, you know, there are strong lifestyle issues at play there. Is this meat eating? This is this obesity. Uh, skin cancer, obviously sun exposure. And, you know, perhaps we can come back to global warming in a minute because I think there is something there about climate change and skin cancers. Um, but also breast cancer. So, you know, is it that we're looking for them more? Therefore, we find is this, you know, maybe more screening programs. So a lot to unpick in this, but certainly raising lots of interesting questions. And I think the cancer charities will certainly have a lot to say about this and to chew over. Well, they have. I mean, you know, CRUK said in this story that there is some evidence of rise of cancer rates among 18 to 49 year olds. Right. But, you know, this may be alarming, but the majority of new cancer cases are in those aged over 50. Yeah. So uh, what do you think about I have a load of friends at the moment who who've been going on various health checks because mm -hmm. their employer basically pays them to go on their annual health check. And I just noticed a couple a couple more than I would normally expect you saying oh you know i'm just i've been referred for the for a cardiac scan mm. or people who are going for these these health checks that are specifically cancer health checks you know they scan the the abdomen and other other bits below the below the belt and i just wonder what what do you think of the benefit of them because the nhs is health check which is supposed to be um is supposed to be something that we all can access at 50 and then 60. But I mean, the reality is, is that the NHS's health check is not as reliable uh, in happening. I mean, I, when I turned 40, I didn't get contacted until I was 45 to do mine. Um, so, you know, that's why we talk about it as a sickness service, not a preventive service. What's your view as a clinician of okay. the services that, you know, you pay 500 quid to go and have a scan for all types of different things? Okay. So there's, there's lots of stuff in what you've just said. So just to be clear that the, NHS health check is particularly a cardiovascular disease health check. It's so it's looking for health related problems. So that's hypertension, um, yes, high blood pressure, sorry. Um, it's looking for raised cholesterol. It's looking for diabetes, which are all things that can lead to a whole heap of complications later on and where early intervention is massively helpful and where lifestyle changes are massively helpful. So it's very focused on those sort of disease areas. Whereas what you're talking about, these more generic body scan things are looking potentially for early cancers, as well as a few of the things that the NHS health check goes for and I am very much of the opinion beware beware there is a massive risk of picking up incidental findings which are of no consequence which leads to harm the reason the end so we have a really good we had Callie Palmer on the on the podcast a few episodes ago talking about cancer screening and cancer prevention and for something to make the grade as an NHS cancer screening test it has to meet a lot of high standards and proving that early intervention helps 
uh, that there's a test that's reliable that we can trust that's not going to cause too much harm by over diagnosis of incidental things and these health checks these private health checks do not fit that criteria now Though the ones that involve ionizing radiation, so that's x-rays, have a very specific additional risk of harm by giving you too much radiation over time, although they, those tend to be moved away from now and it's more ultrasound scans that are happening or MRI scans which don't have the ionizing radiation harms. But you can pick up a multiplicity of things that are of no consequence at all that lead to further investigations, lots of worry, lots of cost, and you build a vicious circle. So I am very wary when family and friends have said this, I say to them, look, if you've got a problem, there is something specific, let's go looking for it. I do agree there are times when you've got family history or specific worries that it may be you give you peace of mind to have something. But, you know, these are by and large, not evidence-based, not recommended, and we need evidence and trials and studies to be sure. So, Steve, if you're asking me, should you go for a health check? Uh, by all means, go for your NHS health check. In fact, please do. Uh, beyond that, let's talk about what the symptoms are first. Let's put it in context. Let's measure it. Let's work out what your pre-test probability of there actually being a problem is before you waste your, your you know, hard-earned post-tax pounds. Thank you, doctor. Okay, should we go for this? So, Helen, this is a question that we've been asked, which links, really, this is from Roger, Roger Greer. What does success look like for the Secretary of State for Health before the general election? This, in a way, is linked to an event which your former uh, bailiwick at the Academy mm. of Medical Royal Colleges held an event yesterday in Parliament, on Tuesday in Parliament, which was called A Future of Healthcare. And it was sort of a collaboration between the government, the, the library here and the academy. And we had speakers from the three main parties mm -hmm. and the SNP, actually, talking about what does future healthcare look like? What's the next government should be considering? And so Roger's question is, what does success look like for the Secretary of State before before the next general mm -hmm. election? What As opposed to after. I think that's a cracking question because... You know, we know we're going to have a general election within the next year. We also realistically uh, has to be within the next 15, 16 months. Um, and there's two, there's two elements to this, aren't there? There's what does success look like for the Conservative Party? And what does success look like for the NHS and the public? And I think those are not necessarily the same thing. So speaking as a <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm, not. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking as both a frontline clinician and a potential patient, you know, I success looks like an NHS that is functioning more smoothly alongside a social care system that is working in tandem better uh, with IT that's joined up with waiting lists that are definitely falling um, and with patient satisfaction starting to improve. Um, there's 101 other things I'd like to talk about, about the well-being and morale of staff and so on. But that's my starter. How about you? Well, if you're Steve Barclay, your Secretary of State for Health, before mm. the next election, you got a very clear brief, right, from the Prime Minister as to what success looks like, which is one of the five priorities, quotes, cut the waiting lists, close mm. quote. That would look like success um if it was cut by 10 percent, i suppose that would be cutting the waiting lists but you know when you've got seven million people on the waiting list uh, that's gonna it's gonna have to be cut significantly for success personally i would say success looks like putting in place a system that stems demand into the health service over the next five to ten years which is what we're all about right which is what this podcast is all about is at the yeah. moment demand is outstripping supply by significant margins. And so I would, if I was Secretary of State, I would want to be talking a very, very strong game on preventing the major conditions, which are, you know, take up so much of the health services resource and time. I want to be yeah. putting that sort of system in place. I think that's what success looks like for him before the next election. Well, I'm to that. I mean, certainly prevention is what we're all about on the podcast, isn't it? And I, and I think it's putting in a system that has sustainability, that has isn't just a bunch of sound bites, but that actually has longevity, um, that is looking to the medium term and the future. Because I think the worry is that saying quick things without there being anything behind them is difficult. And I know this is one of the perennial challenges with um, the cycles, the parliamentary cycles, is planning far enough ahead to make meaningful change. And prevention really does involve a medium to long-term approach, not just a short-term one. So um, it's a really good question from Roger. 
Yeah, it is. Anyway, that's all we've got time for. Um, we, we'll be back with uh, our, our next episode and some guests. You can contact us, podcast at stevebryan.com, with your questions and suggestions. You can find us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter, and all the social media channels that are available to you in order to suggest things for pod surgery. And, um, and we'll be back next time, Helen. We certainly will. And in the meantime, please, everybody, bear in mind the stinky hot weather. Do... Do all the sensible stuff, wide-brimmed hat, protective clothing. Use the proper sun cream, whatever your skin tone, and stay safe. And please look out for the vulnerable because actually, you know, the UK Health Authority have, have got heat alerts out, which means it is serious. And look out for dogs. Definitely. Monty is very dogs. hot. Um, just a, a final update for your Monty is that he went to his dog sitter yesterday and I got a text from them saying that he's very hot but has spent the whole afternoon in the paddling pool, which he refuses to leave. Excellent. So that sounds to me like a, a good place great. to be. <laughs> so and a great place to finish. Monty's a smart boy. Okay. Monty's <laughs> my dog for anyone who doesn't know. Until next time. See you then. Bye. Bye. Bye.